You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Hey, it's Jordan. Earlier this week on The Big Story, we explored Canada's plummeting fertility rate. We asked why. Our guest pointed out several possible reasons, one of them being the financial costs. Then we released that episode and, well, our listeners confirmed that en masse. I am just going to scroll through a few responses on social media. Society has made it financially impossible to have children. Until that changes, people won't have babies. With the cost of living and inflation at such high levels, many families are either having one child or none at all. Economically, it is almost impossible to have multi-child families. No surprise here, cost of living sky high, accommodations, rent, mortgage payments, no change in sight. Who can afford kids these days? When owning a home is going to take more than two full-time incomes, is it any surprise? Give me a clean, safe, basic three-bedroom apartment that is not a shoebox for $2,000 a month. I'll do my part and give Canada all the babies it wants. There were a lot of these. Um, It was honestly depressing to read so many of them. People who would otherwise want to have children, want to have big families, who feel like there's no way they can feasibly do that today. So luckily, we have another podcast that is dedicated to exploring why traditionally normal things like mm, having a child with your partner are unaffordable. And It tries to find ways to do those things anyway. So, here with pretty perfect timing is this week's episode of that podcast. Have a kid in this economy? Enjoy. I wasn't feeling well, really tired. I was sick. I was like, okay, there's something else going on here. So I took a test and I was pregnant. We are calling this listener Casey. Our first thought was, this is going to be expensive. You know, you always see in articles, the average cost of a child can be like $300,000 over a night. Casey is 26. She lives in Toronto with her partner and their now six-month-old daughter. Together, they are sharing a one-bedroom apartment. I think imagining lifestyle um, and trying to imagine raising a kid differently than what we grew up with is really like the financial concern for us. Casey and her partner grew up in single-family homes with yards to play in. Their parents worked hard to support them on modest incomes. But now that they want to do the same for their child, it seems impossible to provide what they once had, despite being more educated and making more money than their own parents. What do you think of that? Hmm? Casey's currently on maternity leave. So we reached her at home where, as you can hear, she's taking care of her daughter. Diapers, diaper cream, wipes, clothing. They're always out growing clothing. Casey's pregnancy wasn't planned. So her and her partner didn't have much time to save before the baby arrived. Um, Now that the baby's here, there have been a lot of new household expenses really life-saving to get the band for the breast pump so you can use your hands. But, uh, she says, the biggest and most shocking expense is just child care. As soon as I could hold a laptop, I started looking for daycares. I had to put a deposit down. You pay by the month. It's basically like rent. With all these new costs have come difficult conversations. Never ending questions. Like, should they move out of the city and try making it work in a smaller town where housing is more affordable? Should they move in with relatives to help save for a down payment? Should Casey go back to work after 12 months or continue taking care of the baby until childcare costs go down? Or if she does go back to work, how can she stay competitive in the workplace and still be a present mom? I'm looking into ways I can advance my career. I'm still pretty early in my career. There are some certificate programs I can take, but have to do a huge amount of saving beforehand. And I don't have a parent that could help me financially with something like that. I think 
it'll be harder to make future progress. For now, they've decided to stay in Toronto and make things work in the apartment. Yeah, I think we're not in the worst scenario, but from my childhood experience and you know, my partner's experience, and, you know, I think we're doing a little better in some regards, but certainly quality of life and expectations are different now. What Casey wants to know is, how the heck do new parents afford a child in this economy? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings, and you are listening to In This Economy. It's a show where we help you understand the systems behind your money problems, and that includes everything from grocery bills to mortgage payments, buying a car, having a kid, and everything in between. In each episode, I talk to a listener who has a financial challenge and then an expert who can explain the factors behind that problem and who can offer ideas, solutions, pivots, no perfect fixes, but things you can do even in this economy. Casey mentioned that she's read a child can cost $300,000 to raise to adulthood. So we'll start there. Now, in 2017, a Statistics Canada study concluded that medium income earning parents with just one child will spend $375,000 to raise them to age 17. Now, compared to this economy, 2017 was ages ago. So in 2023 dollars, that is the equivalent of 455,000 bucks, taking into account that the cost of living has risen 21% since 2017. So yes, that's a scary number. It's almost half a million bucks and it's a real figure. But does it have to cost that much? To help me find out, I called Melissa Leong. I mean, there are a lot of costs that get wrapped up in this big, frightening number. Melissa is a financial expert. She's a mom of two, and she's the author of the Feel Good Finance Guide, Happy Go Money. Her book combines happiness psychology and personal finance to show you how to get the most delight for your dollar. I've seen other figures as well from different publications. You know, $13,000, for example, was another recent number I saw a year. Can you do it for less? Of course you can. You know, my. <laughs> right. I think of my my grandparents who immigrated here with nothing and they had a bajillion children <laughs> and you 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 make it work you make the sacrifices that you need to build the life that you want for your family only you can decide what what that looks like but is it ideal you know the number that you have in terms of an income and the and the life that you want to live with your family not always but that's kind of the reality of being human well, you talk to a ton of people about money and money problems, and I've seen stories um, that it's not just climate change scaring people off from having kids, but that young people are deciding uh, sometimes not to have kids because they don't think they can make it work financially. Do you hear any of that in your day-to-day -day, talking to people about money? Yes. I mean, we make a lot of decisions based on money, and family is not something that is restricted from that. But the decision to have children is a massive one. And a lot goes into that choice and that big life decision. Money is a big factor. I have many friends who have worried about that question. And I also have many friends who decided not to have more than one. They had one. They thought this is very expensive. <laughs> mm -hmm. We are happy with the life we have now. Let's not rock the boat. And I have had that conversation with my husband about, you know, do we want to have more kids? We are in a place now where we can afford to give the ones we have uh, the life that we um, that we're proud to give them. So, absolutely, it's a factor. When you're talking to somebody about money and parenting, what do you tell them to do before uh, they embark on parenthood? What should they be doing to determine, first of all, uh, if they can afford to have a child, but also just 
if they're going to do it, how they can plan for it. When I was planning to have my first kid, I remember being really overwhelmed by all of the information on the internet. But what I found comfort in was the numbers. You can't hide from the numbers. You know, the, the numbers will give you a very clear picture of what's happening right now. So getting extreme clarity on your financial situation right now. What is your current situation? You know, can you calculate your existing expenses, your housing bills, your debt? Where is your money going right now? Hmm. And then getting an idea of do you have a surplus? And can that surplus go to things like, you know, priorities for the kids <laughs> and looking at, you know, your diapers, your your formula, your baby gear, whatever it is. Um, and if this is something that you're seriously considering, making sure that you look at that emergency fund that becomes, if you don't already have one, because 50% of Canadians, according to surveys, don't have an emergency fund. That's something that you definitely need to focus on as you start family planning. You know, there are a lot of online tools and apps that assist you in estimating costs. And I think doing the homework and trying to understand parental leave benefits and how long, what the options are for you, that's super important. How do you prepare for parental leave in terms of budgeting? Because uh, our listener, for instance, uh, Casey, is on parental leave right now and has had her income cut a bit and is really kind of struggling with that transition from a full-time salary to a percentage of that. That was a slap in the face <laughs> for me. Why? I, rem I remember. Did, I, did that hurt you when it happened? I, I just remember thinking, yeah, I can do this. And then when it actually happened and I was sleep deprived and, and not making good financial decisions with my money because I was stressed and tired, that reduced income felt really like it stung, you know, it, it caused even more stress. And so, I mean, it's probably, it's, it's too late for Casey, but for other families, what I tell them is to stress test. Huh. So basically after you review and adjust your a spending based on what you think after running the numbers, you will actually be taking in. Right. You know, can you live you if you, you know, if you're if you have the opportunity to do so, can you and your partner maybe just sock away one person's income and try to live on a single one to get yourself prepared and if you can do that for a period of time, then one person's income can go to savings, which is what you need. Hmm. You need to create a buffer for that reduced income and understanding what uh, what may come down the road. I know that's so hard. But for example, for me, I understand, given that I talk about money a lot, that my choices today affect my choices and opportunities for the future. And I was getting a maternity leave top up. But I thought, just what if? What if Melissa Leong, who is mega ambitious, who loves her job, what if she just doesn't want to go back? When the time comes, yeah. then I have to pay back $8,000 in maternity leave top up. And if I spend it, I'm going to be hurting and it's going to affect my decision in the future um, and give me less options in terms of finding work or not finding work or quitting my job. And so I socked eight grand away while I was on maternity leave. I basically got the top up and I put it right away into a separate bank account because I did indeed <laughs> make that choice. And paid it all back. You paid it all back. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm going to ask you more about parental leave and careers right now because we've segued into that. I understand you're a mom of two. And uh, Casey, as I mentioned, just had her first one. But she's young. She's 26. She still wants to progress her career. Um, she wants to increase her earning power so she can afford all of this. And she's really struggling with how to balance that? Like, how how do you become a caregiver and a family planner and all of that while still being able to keep the ambition and the drive to succeed in a way that will, like, materially reward you, right? We're not talking about doing it out of the goodness of your heart here. We're talking about, like, I'm only 26. I need to get higher in this career so that I can earn more. Casey, I have no idea. At least that's an honest <laughs> answer. I appreciate that. No, You know what? I have no idea because every single day I wake up and I just try to figure it out for myself and for my family. What's right for us? No one can tell you what that balance is for you. But I, the, the piece of advice that I do give is from my personal experience, you cannot do it all 
You cannot do it all. There's mm. a fallacy out there where they tell you women can have it all. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Society hasn't caught up to you. So yes, you want to have all of those things, but you may have an employer who doesn't really have the flexibility when it comes to giving you options. You may be in a career where time away, because that's what StatsCan says, time away to take care of your children, it affects your earning potential. It affects your opportunities at work. There are some employers and some industries that are a little bit more supportive of working moms. And I you know, no one ever says working dad, right? It's just, it's just, right. that's a dude. But for <laughs> women, um, finding people who will support you, you know, supportive workplaces, supportive mentors, that's really important. For me, I, it was a shock for many of my friends, coworkers and family members, what I chose to do. I chose to step away to spend more time. I thought I was giving up a, you know, $70,000 a year salary. But more importantly, it was a career that I had put my blood, sweat and tears into. Mm -hmm. uh, journalism is a hard career. It's not a nine Nobody to five. Nobody does it for the money. <laughs> no. But if you build a career that you're proud of, you think, am I going to walk away for this? But I was buying thousands of hours with my children. And what I learned was I found a way. I found a way. I was motivated by something different, something very powerful, building a life for me and my kids on my own terms, what I have now with what I've, you know, the people that I've chosen to work with along the way and the career that I have built today, what it gives me is flexibility. And that is gold. To me, that is more important than anything. I have the ability to use my time as I choose. And that's what I want. Is this for everybody? You know, is entrepreneurship for everyone? No, but this is you and your life and life is about seasons and you have a season of working your butt off and you can have a season of stepping back hmm. and working your butt off in another way because you're still working when you're at home. <laughs> it's, right. it's just unpaid. That was an excellent answer to a fairly existential question that I asked you. So now I'm going to ask you some very practical ones. And this is something Casey mentioned. She mentioned seeing everything now uh, in terms of costs, as in how many uh, boxes of diapers that would be. <laughs> I remember uh, in those early days of parenthood as well, you're so desperate for everything to go well. You're so desperate to get some sleep. And you're being told that any number of things will make your baby's life better, will make your baby fall asleep sooner, will give you a better bond with your baby or give your baby a head start with this toy. There's a whole industry out there like preying on that feeling. How do you decide what you need to buy for your child and what you don't need to buy? When I first had Jet, my, my oldest, I remember not knowing what to do and what I would need. And I downloaded a list off the internet of what I needed. And then I sent that list to a bunch of my friends, asking them what they thought and to give me their lists. Hmm. And I vividly remember getting my best friend's list. Carrie, I love you, but your list was ridiculous. <laughs> it was... I'm not going to swear, but it was such BS. The super duper extra expensive sleep sack. It was like the most expensive stroller, this weird oscillating seat thing that looked like an alien pod that's supposed to lull your kid into this uh, <laughs> calm right. state. The Ferrari of strollers. Absolutely. That was important to her, but not necessarily important to me. And so I had to really get a lot of second opinions. I basically found lists and I cross-referenced them with lists from my most practical, frugal friends. And I just realized that my, my personality and my values when it comes to stuff is very different than maybe other people's. Of course, I get caught up with mommy influencer, um, the infinite scroll of things that they say we need to get. But um, I regret it. <laughs> <laughs> that was my next question, which is, what did you buy that that you regret that you would advise, you know, parents to be like, don't get sucked down that one? Oh, whenever I talk about these things, it's so tough because we are all different. So I'm going to lean on research and I'll tell you what the science says and how I've tried to live my life in line with what, you know, researchers have told me about spending my money <laughs> mm -hmm. in terms of finding fulfilling joy. I regret spending on things that didn't align with my values. So stuff. I don't really value stuff. I bought a crib. The babies never slept in it. <laughs> Every single toy that I bought my kids, 
guess what? I regret it. The furniture, any kind of furniture that is little, I regret it. Hmm. The decor, anything that's for tiny baby, regret it because it was so temporary. And there's this thing that happens in psychology, neuroeconomists explain that, especially when you've got like high pressure situations like having a kid, you have present bias you're stressed. And present bias means you're going to think that this part of your life or this thing that's happening is going to last forever. Yep. Um, and that's just not the case, especially with little ones. So leaning back on what, my, what I value, I value memories and experiences. So all the money that I spent on creating memories for my kids, like stuff that we did together, family vacations, I don't regret that. Love it. Happy. Glad I spent the money on that. Keepsakes, things that I could remember, like their little tiny handprint and just mm. stuff that would help me experience that joy again. Still an experience like when they painted something and I put it on my wall in a frame. Never regret that. Uh but the the values thing, leaning on your values, that will help you dictate, you know, it, long term, is this going to give me <laughs> pain to look back and think that I spent it on this? And some things you don't know because values also change. You know, you, you mentioned sleep. And back in the day with my first, I would have done anything. I would have paid anything mm -hmm. for sleep. We spent money on a sleep coach. I spent money on all yeah. sorts of pillows and this and that. And I have changed and it's not in line with my values anymore. And this is just me confessing maybe on your podcast. But if I could take back every moment and every dollar that I spent on trying to get my kid to sleep instead of just going in there and comforting him because he was afraid <laughs> at night. I'm so sad about it when I think about it. Yeah. Um, I would because it was temporary. and you know, we think that this is going to be hell forever, but every season is so short. You know, what do they say about having a kid? The days are long, mm -hmm. but the years are short. That's actually a really fitting segue to my next question, because they get older and they get older more quickly than you would like. And all of a sudden they have voices of their own. And more importantly, I think wants no! and desires of no! their own. <laughs> so how about when they start hitting that age and they can start saying, um, I mean, I want to play hockey and I'd like to be a goalie, the most expensive position, or they want their own tablet to play games on because they're tired of uh, seeing you play with a phone and not being able to do it themselves. And they start asking you for things. How do you make those decisions? I raise my, my, uh, my first one is so cerebral. He is, he and I have a lot of deep conversations and we've had them since he was very, very young. And what I've realized from talking to him so much is that he learns more by watching me. So he will pick on something that I've done or something that I've said to my husband when it comes to finances, and he'll bring it up again, he'll weaponize it, use it against me. And so it really starts early. By the time they start asking for stuff, you've already shaped their want. You've already shaped their understanding of needs and choices. And so you know, if you haven't gotten there yet to the point like Jed is eight now, but I started having conversations with him much earlier than that and doing things purposely in front of him when it came to money, going to the grocery store, talking about budgeting, talking about, okay, I have this much. Right. I have to choose. When he would go to the dollar store, I would make him choose. My second one is amazing. We were at Dollar Tree two days ago and he had an armful of toys because I looked away for two seconds. And I said to him, I have a dollar, so you have to choose. And he said, okay, mommy. But then he said, can we just take a picture of these other things that I want? And maybe one day when we come back, I'll remember right. and I'll buy it. And I thought, that's excellent. That's excellent. That's what I do today. I have a list on my phone of stuff I want to buy. <laughs> and if you don't think about it later, then that means uh, you shouldn't have bought it. Until, you know, you left it in your shopping cart and the company emails you and says, hey, don't forget, you should buy this. <laughs> A little later on, um, presumably, those smart kids are going to go off to university. And I mentioned university not just to talk about RESPs, but also to ask you how you balance. So you're constantly facing all these in-the-moment pressures to spend that you just mentioned. And you're being told, well, they're going to go up and they're going to go to college. You better start saving up now. Um, mm. How do you balance that? And how do you exist with not feeling like you're either shortchanging their present or their future? I don't know. I feel like that every day. 
I feel like I am uh, uh, fair enough. I'm doing something today that oh, am I doing enough? It's the mom guilt, right? It's the parental guilt you feel that I am I teaching them everything they need to know? Am I preparing them for the world? And I do tell, especially women nowadays, more and more that you need to prioritize yourself. The world tells mm. you that you're not doing enough. The world tells you that you're not being a good enough parent. And at the end of the day, you all you have to do is try. And if you think about your own parents, you know, I, I, so many of my friends, um, you know, they're the children of immigrants, people who came here and gave everything to their children. But now the children have to look after them. So what you want is you want to prioritize yourself that your kids never have to worry about you. You put your own oxygen mask on first before helping others, right? right. So when it comes to prioritizing your savings goals, that's from, first of all, emergency fund, because it does help your family. Um, debt repayment, because that does help your family. Then at, you know, <sighs> retirement, your retirement. And then maybe simultaneously or after that, education, if that is important to you, so you can get that free money from the government by opening an RESP. A quick sidebar right here. The free money Melissa's talking about, it comes when you open up a registered education savings plan for your child and start contributing. The government then matches a percentage of your contributions through what's called the Canada Education Savings Grant, up to a lifetime maximum of $7,200. What about childcare? I imagine this is a question uh, you get a lot from parents here in Toronto. Uh, I know it can cost anywhere from fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars or more a month. I know there is a ten dollar daycare program. I also know that's not everywhere, and it can be tough to get. Explain yes. uh, how to navigate that for parents. That was one of the reasons why I decided actually not to go back into the office. Um, and a lot of parents are stuck in that situation where they have to do very early research on local daycare options and costs before they're even pregnant. Because I remember back in the day, the waiting lists were crazy and trying to find places that were um, affordable, uh, places that would have great deals, for example. So there were some co-ops that would, would uh, reduce your fees, for example, if you came in and volunteered once a week. Hmm. So there were some alternative childcare arrangement, arrangements that were out there for people. This is when I was doing family planning and looking. You know, we looked at everything. We looked at, okay, do we have, would our mother-in-law come in even just half days, some days? You know, can my husband and I stagger, especially when we've got work from home now? Um, post pandemic, where we have a little bit more flexibility in terms of maybe finding something that was within our budget, that's that's hard, right? I mean, yes, we've got the ten dollar day childcare program that's coming out, um, and you just need to do your research. You need to register. You need to understand your eligibility criteria. You need to look into what's in your area, and if you currently don't have it, then you have to do the 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 extreme clarity I was talking about at the start of the um the interview where mm -hmm. you look at what you have <laughs> and how much this is going to cost and what other benefits yep. that you can take advantage of. It's everything is going to help, right? Your child tax benefit, your universal child care benefit. Um, you know, even pro you've got provincial programs for additional support. All of these things, you have to do the homework. If parents are interested in learning more about the programs that are out there, I would suggest that they visit their local government websites. So your, your local province, um, the Government of Canada's campaign. They're putting out a lot of information about their federal child care initiative, and they'll have more information online. The last thing I want to ask you, and I think it might be uh, perhaps the most important thing in terms of a mindset uh, between finances and parenting, is, you know, one of the, the things that keeps coming up, and you mentioned it uh, in terms of immigration, is we want to give our kids a better life than we had, or at the very least, the same standard that we grew up with. And Casey mentioned to us, she's raising a kid in an apartment. She can't afford a house. Nobody can afford a house. And she thinks about when she was a kid and, you know, she had a backyard and a lot of outdoor play and all that kind of stuff. And it can feel like you're not giving your kids even what you had because it's so tough right now. How do you navigate that? And you know, how, do, how does our understanding of what it means to be a parent or a family need to change to accommodate just the reality of this economy? 
This is a tough question because it's multifaceted. There are numbers, research that supports the idea that obviously children who grew up in tough economical situations, in poverty, that um, has a lot of implications for their well-being, for their mental health, for their physical health, for, for their academic health, many, many things. But I'm not going to focus on that because that's an entire, that's a, I could talk about that um, for another mm -hmm. half hour. And it's structural. It, it's a, a serious issue, affordability in our country and many parts of the world. It, it is absolutely a serious issue. But I'm going to address situations like Casey where she may be feeling, how do I give my child everything that I want for them? including my own benchmark of what I had when I was young. And every single time I talk to my friends, my family, my coworker, when we talk about the things that we want for our children, yes, you want to give them the absolute best. But when we talk about our own <laughs> upbringing, our own childhood, and we talk about what we really gained from that, the love, a sense of safety, a sense of hmm. um not just safety and like living in a in a in a you know a, a home <laughs> that is free from crime and abuse i'm talking about a safety to be who you are to be seen those things have nothing to do with money and this is when i say i always talk about when it comes to finances you tell yourself a story you have a script from your own childhood, but that script doesn't need to be the script that you raise your children with. And so leaning back mm. on your values, the things that you think are most important, um, encouraging financial literacy in children, you want to pass on generational wealth. There are other ways to do that aside from handing them a property, you know, teaching them about money in a healthy, um, empowering way that can absolutely be helping when it comes to their wealth in the future and teaching them the things that you value that are outside of dollars and cents. And so over the holiday season, my children and I, we decided to, we were going to de deliver um, presents for a charity to children uh, in underprivileged neighborhoods, because that is something that I think is important. It has nothing to do with mm -hmm. um, me giving them everything that they necessarily need, but it, my, I'm passing on to them the things that I, that make me feel wealthy. Thanks to Melissa for all of this helpful and hopefully reassuring information. The truth is, there isn't really a quick or a universal answer to how to be a good parent. And not much of being a good parent involves money. But here are three things that we hope you take away from this conversation. First, align your spending with your values. If you're on a fixed income, you can't have it all, I'm sorry. That is the truth. But what you do have is the power to decide what you spend your money on. So ask yourself, what can I buy today that is going to make me feel good later? When your spending aligns with your values, that's kind of like buying happiness. Second, you have to ditch the guilt. Put your own oxygen mask on first by creating an emergency fund, by paying off debt, and by saving for retirement. Worry less about what you can't buy your kids and instead focus on creating a safe and loving home environment for your family. Because that really is what matters most, and hopefully that's what they'll remember when they're older. Finally, number three... I have homework for you. You need to do research on what benefits are available to you. As Melissa mentioned, government websites have great information about what is available, who qualifies, and how to apply. If there's a specific benefit you think needs more explanation, please reach out and maybe we will cover it on a future episode. As you should know by now, we are always looking to listeners for the next guest, for the next topic, for whatever, and you can email us at hello at itepod.ca and you can call us and leave a voicemail. 
at 416-935-5935. Thank you so much for listening. This show has been off to a terrific start, mostly because you folks actually tune in. So we would very much like your continued support and your word of mouth, which is the most valuable way of getting a podcast out into the public. So if you like it, tell your friends, tell your family, share it with your kids if you're trying to afford them. You can find us on social media, on Instagram and TikTok at In This Economy Pod. And of course, in every single podcast player, you better rate review, like, follow, subscribe, whatever it is they tell you to do. I am your host and executive producer, Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This episode was written and produced by Stephanie Phillips. The sound design was done by Robin Edgar. Mary Jubrin is our digital editor. Diana Kay is our manager of business development. And all together, we're the Frequency Podcast Network, and we'll talk to you next week on In This Economy. <laughs>